we start formally, since we've got everybody here, so very good morning, my name is CJ, we had a discussion about what do you know about week one U, and uh, before we go into the details, basically this is our whole breakfast uh, that we use to hold every month, uh, due to our very busy schedule, we are sometimes holding about once in two months, so that's around it, we've got a variety of topics, depending on um, what is popular uh, during the time of period, and for this time, because uh, uh, the founding Prime Minister of uh, Singapore has just passed away last month, so we thought we might as well look into what are some of the leadership secrets, and by leadership secrets, we are less going into uh, what are some of the uh, things they did right politically, what are the things they did wrong politically, we are more looking on what we can learn from the corporate point of view, uh, the leadership lessons that we can learn from the point of view. So, uh, we had a discussion just now. Uh, what do you What do you know about um, Lee Kuan Yew? So, <clears throat> we're gonna start here. Um, and anything about anything you hear about, um, you uh, read about it in the media, or you uh, uh, somehow found out about it. And some of us may have worked or studied in, in Singapore, have traveled to Singapore, and may have an, an understanding. It is very true. Um, in terms of uh, the top politicians in the world, they are the highest paid politicians in the world. Uh, by a few times. Uh, yes. they, are, they are paid twice as much as Obama. So yes. uh, <laughs> what else? <laughs> I, uh, He has lots of uh, insights on uh, many important international affairs, including on China, on U.S., and uh, many international leaders uh, right. <coughs> come to uh, went to him for consultations on sure, the sure. most important affairs. So I, sure. I I plan to read his uh, some of his books. Maybe sure. maybe uh, you can uh, recommend some of right, his books right, right. in the middle. Sure, 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 sure. There's some memoirs, and uh, one of the key things that you, you met, uh, mentioned correctly, Singapore is a very small country, uh, and for some reason, yeah, they actually are, is able or was able to actually bring Singapore to an international uh, prominence. That it was often consulted by a lot of Western governments, there are, you know, there are superpowers, whether it's US or it's UK, and so on, uh, to the, to a certain extent that. Even when he's no longer a prime minister, if he wants to meet up with an American president, he can get it for Right. So, so that that is the status. Uh, he was quoted by <coughs> former British prime, prime minister Margaret Thatcher as, you know, he was never wrong. Not to say that he was really never wrong, but in terms of his reading of international relations, uh, it's like he's, he's got very good insights. And so we will talk about that in a while. And to a certain extent, uh, you know, in, in, in uh, cross-strait relationships, right, that is, you know, in China, in mainland China, there's always a, 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 a phrase called that you have an uh, agreement of 992, right, uh, basically was negotiated in Singapore, right, uh, so, so basically Singapore was, was deemed as the uh, neutral country, with a lot of Chinese people, and um, was also uh, ha ha had good relationships uh, between mainland China and Taiwan. So, uh, so, so it was chosen as a, as a neutral space, it was uh, with good ties with both parties, so it brought both parties negotiators to one place and had the negotiation. Right? So in a way, he was able to leverage that to, to, to some of his um, uh, advantage. What about here? <coughs> what do you know about uh, Lee Kuan Yew? Yeah, I think uh, uh, Mr. Lee, he treats uh, Singapore like a big family. Or like a big, big family? Uh, big company. Yeah, so big company. He, and that's why okay. he, he paid a very good, good salary. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's a company. Uh, so uh, I don't know about that. I mean, I, I don't know <laughs> if you work for a family business, are you going to get a Probably not. <laughs> yeah. And I think uh, basically he's uh, English. And 
but uh, his uh, management uh, skill come from uh, Japanese or Hispanic? Uh, uh, all. <laughs> It's my understanding, and uh, he, uh, he think uh, human nature is bad. So he must, uh, uh, human nature is bad. So maybe the red is losing better. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay. And uh, because uh, he, he uh, actually in the very beginning his uh, situation, oh, sure. in Singapore is very bad. Sure, sure, sure. It has to be very tough. Uh, right, uh, right. Must. Uh, his people, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. people's be a very tough. Sure, uh, sure. Uh, so yeah. tough. Okay. Uh, what are key things? I mean, uh, I think Lee Kuan Yew was around 18, 19 years old when uh, Singapore was occupied by the Japanese. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so, 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 Singapore was under the um, uh, Japanese occupation from uh, 1942 to 1945. So it was about 18, 19 years old, and uh, what what happened was when uh, when after after the um, Japanese attack and the British sur surrender, there was a, a few days of period where there was no um, there was no government in uh, in Singapore for a few days, so. and because of that, there was uh, a lot of looting. I mean, a lot of people just uh, just just went to shops and break in the shops and carry out everything. So what the Japanese did, what the Japanese soldiers did, was um, they caught a few of those thieves and uh, chop off their heads wow. and hang their heads on a lot of uh, lampposts uh, in a few places, yeah. right? And immediately everything stopped, right? No more looting. So, so uh, that uh, that event has got a profound uh, uh, impact on the economy in the sense that right, there are certain things that if you uh, take very severe and harsh measures, <coughs> you won't get the results. <coughs> sure. Right. So, so, so that, uh, that, 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 was, that, was, that was the, the implication. So, uh, despite all the atrocities, you know, uh, people getting killed, being, uh, getting machine gunned down, uh, one of the key things that happened during the Japanese occupation is you don't need to leave. Uh, you don't need to lock your doors at night. Is anyone who is caught me? Get their heads chopped off. Right, so so uh, uh, that, that uh, those those sort of things that was was learned as, as part of the lesson. Now, uh, in terms of his management style, it's not all all Japanese learned from everywhere. Anything that was workable, uh, whether it's from the, uh, from the British, whether it's from Americans, whether it's from Dutch, uh, for economic policies and, and so on, it's basically just looking for whatever works. Okay, so that's that's uh, more more about him in the world. So some of the things, some of the backgrounds. Um, Historical background, he was the founding prime minister of Singapore from uh, 1959 to 1990. Uh, again, uh, not the founder of Singapore, because Singapore was founded as a, as a trading port, as a city in 1819 by the Brits, by, by this, this uh, person called uh, Stephen Raffles. Uh, life All right, so, so in terms of the, uh, he was the first prime minister, right, uh, before Singapore was, uh, was an independent country. Uh, <coughs> Some key, uh, what do you call, achievements is that you have uh, you got Singapore from uh, third world to first world in one generation. Right? So that's uh, one of the more key uh, achievements. But even even more, uh, even better than that, and even more unknown than that, less known than that, is what I wanted to mention earlier. It propelled Singapore to be a key international player uh, despite a small size. So he broker international negotiations over here. Um, his views are very much sought after by superpowers uh, around the world. So uh, the, that that part is even harder to achieve than just uh, simple you know, economic uh, achievements. You just need to have the right economic policies. You want to raise the stage stature to be an international player. That's a lot harder. So, um, so the preparers. Okay, the preparers. Um, some, some of us may may heard of things about you now. Uh, you know, in Singapore, there is this form of punishment called. <laughs> we have the, the, the cane, the cane name or whipping, right? Uh, 
right? So, so uh, we're not going to debate on his policies. We're not going to debate on how he crushed his opposition, uh, or even some of the better things that you know, uh, how um, how he made sure that there are there are good policies in place, or even things like a uh, high government pay. Uh, it's it's more of what we can learn from him as a leader, both the good and the bad. As well as well, if, if we ever use some policies, uh, mention some policies as an example, it's it's basically just to use as an illustration. We may cite things like uh, high ministerial pay, uh, not to say whether it's a good or bad policy, but how he makes a decision. Okay, so that's uh, those those will be in some reasons. So it's more of what we can learn from him, and since we are unlikely to run a country. Especially if you are from mainland China, you are highly unlikely to run a country. Uh, uh, so uh, we run, we may run companies, we may be managers of a company. So uh, from a manager point of view, what are things that we can learn and we can apply? So that's that's what we want to achieve uh, for this morning. So key takeaways. Oh, by the way, we will be sending this as PDF format. So we send it to everybody. Uh, Key takeaways: We'll look into what what makes Lee Kuan Yew a great leader. Right? Some key uh, we we there are a lot of things that make him a great leader. He's a very complex person. Uh, he's got a long uh, what do you call long career within in in, in, uh, uh, in national leadership. So at different phases of his career, he actually behaves differently. Right? But Basically, what we can do is we'll just take five. What I personally think is uh, uh, top five leadership qualities. But two is, despite all these leadership qualities, there are certain things that if you apply too much of the leadership qualities, it can have some pitfalls and some uh, what we call uh, drawbacks. Right? So there are too much of a good thing can be bad. 有些就是你有你有些优点，但是你做的太过度的时候反而不好，哎，这个就物极必反。Right, so and if that is the case, so how do you how do you get balance right as a leader? Right, so how how do you balance between what is good and uh, what is too much? So the top five leadership quality. First thing first is I uh, what I what I personally find find out is being totally resolved and.、Uh, Focus to to achieve hard goals. But their goals are hard. Some of us mentioned that Singapore was in a in a poor shape. Well, Singapore wasn't in in that bad of a shape uh, when uh, Lee Kuan Yew took over, especially in 1965 when Singapore gained independence. By the way,、uh, this is this year is、uh, Singapore's uh, 50th uh, anniversary. Interestingly,、uh, some of us mentioned no.、Uh, the, Is, is is Lee Kuan Yew being viewed in Singapore as how Mao Zedong is being viewed in、uh, mainland China? I I would say that Lee Kuan Yew is more viewed、uh, in Singapore closer to how Deng Xiaoping is being viewed in China. Right? It's it's it's, it's、uh, those those two have a closer path.、Uh, <coughs> Both has got、uh, has got、uh, what do you call? Uh, a focus on pragmatism. Uh, in in uh, uh, what Deng Xiaoping mentioned, in, in, in what he said is, "Pay more, buy more." That's all about that. Whatever works. Yeah, it's just, just that. So it's a book that's got a,、uh, a view on、um, well, what is what is、uh, what works and what doesn't work. No, no, sorry, it's over here. Only the there's a camera behind you. <laughs> sorry, it's okay. Just right. <laughs> right.、Um, so. Uh, both、uh, place a lot of emphasis on economic development, and interestingly, both. You know, in 1997,、uh, Deng Xiaoping passed away a few months before the Hong Kong handover.、Mm -hmm. And Lee Kuan Yew passed away a few months before the 50th anniversary of Singapore.、Mm -hmm. Right. So there are, there are a lot of similarities between the two two persons, and both of them were, were, were actually very good friends、uh, with, with all that、uh, negotiations and all that. Right, so so that、uh, that that was um, uh, what, uh, the, the two similarities. And for、um, in 1965, Singapore was not that bad as a place. It was one of the、um, as a city, maybe not as a country, but as a city, it was one of the the, the more prosperous city 
uh, in Asia. Okay, so the um, the, the downside was two things. As a country, it lacks resources. As a city, it's okay, but as a country, it lacks resources. Number two, uh, despite being a very prosperous country, it's got very high levels of inequality of income. So you find that as a city, it looks prosperous, there are a lot of rich people there, or there are a number of rich people there, it's a bustling city, but then there are also a lot of people who are very poor. So uh, that, that, uh, that was imbalance. So, so basically, uh, the difficulty is how, as a very small country, um, size of Singapore is well, back then it was less than 600 square, square kilometers. Right? Uh, right now it's about 600 plus after the land uh, reclamation. Uh, how big is that? If you're in Shanghai, it's about the size of the outer room. That's, that's a whole, whole kind of, uh, it's a very small country. So how do you actually survive and thrive and uh, uh, improve incomes and uh, quality of life, uh, of life in a very small country with, with, without much resources? Okay, so that's that's a, that's a that's a hard challenge. How do you, how do you bridge down the um, uh, income gap? How do you make sure that uh, the majority of population has got good education, good housing, and uh, basic amenities? So those those were those were some of the um, uh, difficulties. And a few years after uh, independence, in terms of national defense, um, Singapore used to rely. The first three years of uh, independence, Singapore relied on the British for national defense. Right? And then in 1968, three years after. Uh, independence, the Brits say, sorry folks, we don't have enough money, we need to cut our military, so we are building up. We are going home. Right? So uh, it's like, it caused a shock for our whole country, and uh, we, we need to find how we can build our own uh, defense. So those are the kinds of difficulties um, that <coughs> there was facing at that part of time. So it's, it's real, it, it, it takes a lot of commitment, a lot of resolve to actually achieve those hard goals. So that, uh, to me, I think that is uh, the most primary key quality. Right? You need to have that kind of commitment, the kind of resolve to actually uh, meet the, the very difficult goals. Uh, two is that um, uh, having the acumen and clarity of insight to make the right decision. So, uh, like I said, you can be committed to a goal, but if you make the wrong decisions, uh, you are going further and further away from the goal. I mean, it could be, it could be that kind of situation, right? So, <clears throat> um, also, number three is Lee Kuan Yew did not work alone. Lee Kuan Yew worked with a team of highly competent, highly capable uh, ministers and, uh, or team members. So, uh, so it's, not, it's not just one person you have a team and how you actually build a team. Uh, setting very extremely high standards to go into some of the examples um, uh, later on, it's not just for others, but also for himself. And last but not least, his way of uh, communication is very direct. Right? Uh, if you cannot uh, stand him, you can't stand him. So, so it's very direct communication. Now, <clears throat> uh, first and foremost, being fully resolved and focused to achieve hard goals. So basically, he's, uh, he's in a position where he has to face a lot of adversity. Right, a lot of difficulties, and how you actually respond in terms of adversity. Right, there is always this um, uh, I, uh, <coughs> this notion that I can do it, I can achieve it, and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll make it. That kind of uh, commitment. Now, this is, <coughs> this is actually a quote from his son, the current Prime Minister of Singapore, Mr. Uh, Lee that you know, the part of the thing that the team wanting to work with Lee Kuan Yew is that Lee Kuan Yew always gives the team a feeling that we can do this, we can win this. No matter how difficult um, the, the situation is, we are able to overcome. But it gives that confidence to the team and he actually drives through it. So that, that in a way uh, attracts people to him and attra drives people to conquer uh, what we call insurmountable goals. Right? You as a leader, I mean, this, the, what I see, how, how I see this applying uh, to, to businesses, to corporates, is that 
you as a leader, uh, how how buy in are you to your own goals or to your business goals? You know, no matter how much difficulty you do, are you really buy in? Can you actually influence your team that you know, no matter how difficult it is, no, ma no matter how many challenges or how difficult challenges there are, are you able to overcome goals? I mean, do you believe you can over, uh, overcome those difficulties? Do you also believe that the goal is something that is worth achieving? Okay, so that's uh, <coughs> that's one thing. Number two, it's also how you are actually being resourceful. It's not just about achieving a goal. Sometimes you've got to think about how, um, how uh, what kind of resources can you tap on to achieve the goal, right? Whether it's internal or external resources. One thing about Lee Kuan Yew about in, in, in about uh, achieving his goals is that. He never ever say that we must rely only on our own people. All right? Or he never say we must rely only on our own resources. Whatever resources, whatever people there are, whether it's internal, foreign, as long as it's usable, it is you use it. So again, this is just some similarities between him and the right? it's, it's Whatever works, we, we, we are not against foreign investment, we are not against foreign talents, we are not against uh, foreign advisors, as long as it works, as long as it will help me achieve my goals and overcome my obstacles, it will be used. That's, <coughs> that's the overall uh, driving principle. <coughs> Number two is how, how you actually uh, <coughs> have the right acumen and, and have the uh, insight. So <coughs> is it able to gain insights while others could not? In 1967, two years after Singapore's independence, he was being asked to make speeches in uh, various places in the U.S., whether it's for Stanford University, whether it's on the radio in the U.S., whether it's on a TV show in the U.S., in 60 minutes on a TV show in the U.S. Basically, in 1967, 1968, there was a time when the Vietnam War is really ongoing. Maybe it's not a little So. <clears throat> He was actually making very crystal clear uh, predictions that basically the Americans are going to run into a lot of trouble. Right? Americans have not realized it uh, back then, but he saw it. Okay, so so to the to the point where Stanford University, after he making uh, made a, a speech that he said uh, this this guy is going to be you know the uh, uh, one of the giants in, in the political uh, arena because he is able to see uh, see through a lot of things. Clearly, but it's natural relationships. Uh, he actually predicted the rise of China uh, way, well, way before uh, way before China, China has, has made through all these reforms. Right. So this is these are some of some of the things that you can gain insights from others could not. Um, one of the key things is whatever he thinks, is he, he most of the time I would not say all the time, but most of the time is not clouded by popular opinions. 所以说就是说,大部分的人觉得是怎么样,他就觉得什么样 He's not a follower of thoughts, he has his own way of analysis Also, it's not, it's also less likely to be clouded by ego or previous success Sometimes we may think that because we have done a certain thing a certain way And as a result, let's do the same thing the same way In the future, we will get future success May not be the case Right, your, your past success, your, your, your past ways of leadership, your past ways of doing things may result in you having success in the past, but it may not result in you having success in the future. There are different times, there are, there are different situations, you need different ways of doing things. So it, it's less prone to uh, uh, say that because I was successful, so you must listen to me. There are some shades of that, but less uh, comparatively. Right, so now again, if, if you are in corporate, if you work for a business and, and find that you, know, you don't have an IQ, you don't have uh, the kind of intelligence as, uh, as, as what Lee Kuan Yew had, how are you to, do, to gain insight on certain things? So this is, this is one tool that um, we can use. I mean, this is what we do as, as part of training, is uh, we have a seven dimensional thinking <coughs> of problem solving. So basically, Whenever you have a problem and you find that you want to sieve out the, uh, uh, the confusion or sieve out different facts from different things, so this is a structure that we can uh, use as a guideline. So the first thing is, you know, um, 
What we have is a problem. Establish, do you have a common goal that you want to deal with that problem? The common goal can be, it's a personal problem you want to resolve, or it can be um, a conflict that you want to overcome. If it's a conflict, is there a common goal that we want to achieve amongst all parties? So start with a goal. You, if you want to overcome a certain problem or a certain challenge, what is the ultimate objective? What is the goal you want to achieve? Start with that first. Number two is look at the facts and look and separate the facts from the emotions. Sometimes we have a problem, we can get frustrated. Sometimes we get uh, we have a conflict, we get very agitated, we get you know, we want to fight the other person. So it, it makes sense to just separate what are the facts and what are the emotions. Just just list the facts. Then from the facts. Look for the positives. What are things that are useful, positive, uh, that are that are good, or, or what what are, what are things that we can see that if we can tweak a little bit, it can become good. Right, so look at the, look, look for the positives. And again, sometimes why are we why are we saying we look for the positive first? Reason being, when we have a problem, we tend to focus more on what the positive or the negative. Now we need to put that control. We should more focus on. 优点还是缺点？看厉害还是不好？毛病那个，这这，我们还有那个problem，我们还有那个problem，我们还有那个problem，我们还有那个problem，我们还有那个problem，我们还有那个problem，我们还有那个problem，我们还有那个problem，我们
of Lee Kuan Yew's temperament. Because Lee Kuan Yew is someone who is very impatient, someone who is very direct, and someone who actually can uh, make very uh, quick judgments. Right, so if you are someone who is impatient, direct, and making quick judgments, and you don't have that kind of intelligence, right, sometimes you can make a lot of wrong decisions in a very quick time. So in a way, this, this will be a way of kind of uh, intentionally slowing things down a little bit, making it more structured, and uh, hopefully you arrive at a better decision. It's just some, some technique uh, for the rest of us. <coughs> now, um, <clears throat> the third thing is Lee Kuan Yew is always working with a team of highly competent uh, members. So uh, just to have a quote from, we'll talk about the quote about it and, and um, what it does in a while. Uh, the quote is, no one is perfect, but a team can be. Right. <coughs> so uh, in, in uh, Lee Kuan Yew's time, especially in the early years of Singapore's founding, um, the cabinet ministers, we've got different people in different specialized areas. Some of us mentioned that Lee Kuan Yew was a lawyer. Right? He was trained in law. He wasn't trained in economics. Right? So what happened is on the team, and this is less known to the rest of the world, um, also of Singapore is, uh, on the team is actually a doctor in economics. So you've got Tinji for sure. So this this is a person that, that founded a lot of uh, economic institutions. Uh, his name was Dr. Go King Su Wu Singh uh, One of the earlier, probably the earliest finance minister, who was also at uh, one time uh, minister of interior and defense, Bo Fang Kuda. So he was one who actually built a lot of uh, good economic policies uh, in Singapore. Right, and then he's got someone who is, who is in charge of taking care of public housing. Right, he's got someone to look into different areas. So, so he's got he's got a team of different specialized areas to look into different things. It's not a, it's definitely not a one man uh, show. Right, so so it's, uh, he's he's not the one person that creates all the miracles. But what is good at is to have that kind of team to form as as a core team. Right, so that's that's, that's part of the leader. Now. <coughs> Um, not only you have a team in specialized areas, you also have team that has specialized team roles. We'll go into team roles in a bit, but generally, Lee Kuan Yew is a kind of very direct, very impatient, very straight talking person. He tends to offend people. Right? Um, if, you, if it doesn't offend people, he frightens away people, people will feel very hurt, you know, especially subordinates. And then it's got some other people on the team who are very maturing, who are very nice, who, are, who, are, who tend to uh, listen a lot more uh, to subordinates. Okay, so, so, so it's got different different people, not just on specialized skills, but also on different temperament and team roles. Uh, <clears throat> last but not least, um, for any team that needs to work well together, if you want to have teamwork that's going to work well together, where right, the key thing is that you need to have team members to trust one another, right? And how do you, how do you have team members to trust one another? I mean, how do you know team members has got high or low trust? And um, this is how part of does. The key thing about trust is does team members understand their own and others' strengths and weaknesses? That is the key thing to trust. I'll explain a lot. Now, team members do know each other's strengths and weaknesses. How do you know each other's strengths and weaknesses? Unless you have a certain assessment and then you get an assessment report and then you get a final story, more often than that is you are likely to have team members sharing, telling one another what I'm good at and what I'm weak at. Now, if you want to share with our team members what you are great at, what you are good at, it's easy. 如果你要跟你的同學分享說你哪方面做得好做得強,應該是一件很簡單的事,你哪方面做得好都都能講。So you can tell people what you're good at. But how how many of us are comfortable telling our team members what we are weak at? That, that is that is a trust. How do you how do you measure trust? If you are able, if you feel comfortable telling someone else, this is one area I'm not good at. 
will talk about it. Right, if you got spelling mistakes here, uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's my fault. No, I'm, not, I'm not really, really that, that much of detail because it's my weakness. So I need some team member to, to do some vetting for me, to do some um, um, uh, editing for me, and to make sure that you know, I, I cover up all my mistakes. So you know, in a way, uh, how comfortable are you to tell your team members some of your weakness? That is how you measure trust. I mean, the, the basic point of how you measure trust. Of course, um, there are other, other forms of trust, uh, how you actually are able to work well together and so on. But the most basic one is, are you willing and able and feel comfortable in sharing your weakness with the team members? That's, that's the basis of trust. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, why, and why this is important is that only when you know each other's strengths and weaknesses can you uh, exploit your strengths and contain weakness. In Chinese, yang chang bi ma, shu chang bu ma. Right, so you let the team members who are strong in certain areas to do what they're strong in. Don't ask them to do what they're weak in. Get other team members to do uh, what they're weak in if, they're, if other members are strong in those areas. So that, that, that is how you make the perfect team. Right? And, and, and the last thing is, of course, uh, if you have the right kind of team roles, the right kind of temperament uh, in a team for a certain purpose, then you, know, you, you make a perfect team. Uh, and by team roles, we mentioned here team roles, just a brief um, um, definition. Team roles is a tendency to behave and contribute and interrelate with others. How you behave in a team, how you would like to contribute to a team, and how you deal with other people in the team. Uh, the key word here is tendency, xin xiang xin. What do I mean by tendency? Now, <coughs> we do this experiment. Uh, how many of us write with our right hand? <laughs> right, so, so uh, this is what we're going to do. You got a pencil and some paper on, on, on the desk. Can you use your left hand to hold a pencil? And uh, write your name, write your Chinese name, and your kan, kanji name with your left hand. This is when you either like your parents or you hate your parents. Yes. <laughs> right. So, um, so in, in, in terms of um, um, tendency, in terms of um, uh, whether you have a tendency to do a certain thing or not, you know, we, we're just looking to the, the left hand right hand. We use three areas, three aspects to measure what uh, the success of how well we write with our left hand. Right? The first thing is, how is the result of you writing with your left hand? How does the writing look like? <laughs> well, uh, some is okay, some is terrible, but compared to your right hand, well, it's, uh, there, there's some gaps, right? Number two is, how is the productivity? So, you, you take a longer time or shorter time? No, no, no productivity, you're going to take a long time to, to, to do it. Um, the third thing is, how do you feel? Uncomfortable. Uncomfortable, right? So, Right, so so this is this uh, these are three things. I mean, can you write with your left hand? Yes. Right. Um, would, would would there be a, 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 a possibility that you will be forced to write with your left hand? Yes. Yes. When? Yes. 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 Uh, <coughs> so, so sometimes you may be forced to use the other hand, you can do it, right? But the tendency is for you to use your right hand, because you do it a lot better. So it's the same thing as team roles. You, you get someone like Lee Kuan Yew who is very impatient, very direct, to be very patient, he can do it. But he's going to do it in a very awkward manner. He won't be doing it in a very... In a very uh, 
uh, smooth and uh, it won't be a very good execution and he's going to feel very uncomfortable as well. 一个即兴的状态就是有耐心，慢慢跟人家说，啊，就是要说话要稳住。It can be done, right? If you really put your commitment to it, it can be done, but it will be very unproductive. Someone else who's got a natural tendency in doing so will do a much better job, right? Than than what than the other tries to do. So that's that's the whole thing about the team part. Can you actually assemble a team that has the right specializations? that has the right team roles, and the team members trust each other enough so that we can actually leverage on the strengths. And within team members, um, you, know, you, you cover each other for the different weaknesses. Right? So that, that is keeping it in, uh, in the, uh, the founding years of Singapore, uh, uh, Lee Kuan Yew basically has, has done that. It's got the team was very strong uh, to a certain extent that it's not just a cabinet team. 不仅是内内阁的那个团队，啊、uh, ，in terms of we talk about Singapore being third,、uh, going from third world to the first world in one generation, and one of the key architects is actually、uh, a Dutch economics a Dutch economics professor who has、uh, who has been、uh, for for more than ten years Singapore's economic advisor. 就他那个说的他内阁的成员，他有一个外国，有有荷兰籍的一个呃经济学教授。Right? And and what 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 this、uh, economics professor did was say, you know, instead of trying to do everything on your own, what you need to do is invite foreign investment, build factories, build whatever, and then they will create employment for you. Right? You give them good、um, good terms. I said,、uh, you don't tax them on profits for the first ten years. You give them uh, land uh, rent free for the first couple of years. You give very good. Um, terms and couple that with your strategic location as a port, as a financial hub. You know, people are going to invest and build factories and create employment. Right, so that that is a very simple concept. And、uh, and that in in the 60s, a lot of newly independent countries were trying to say we are independent. We want to do everything on our own. We want to get rid of all foreign influences. We want to chase away all foreign invest、uh, investment. Right, so Singapore did it the other way, and it was success. The same model was actually shared with Deng Xiaoping. Right, and、uh, the comment from Deng Xiaoping is, "Damn, how I wish I was running Shanghai only. If I'm running Shanghai only, we will achieve what Singapore has achieved in in an even shorter amount of time. Unfortunately, I'm running the whole country." Right, so so that it's going to take a lot, much longer time. So 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 it's 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 a it's a same concept as duplicated in a lot of places. <coughs> so、uh, the fifth <coughs> thing is, you know,、uh, direct and straight to the point communication. The yes is a yes, <coughs> a no is a no. He doesn't care about your face. Right. The good thing about this is that. Now, in in a lot of、uh, especially Asian or Chinese companies, sometimes you need to guess what does the boss really want. You don't know what the boss wants, right? Well, what does the boss mean? And、uh, what we have learned is that whether it's yes, no, whatever, you get a very direct answer. And you don't have to do any guessing. You know what he wants, right?、And、usually, it's very、uh, high standards. I think we we missed out the high standards uh, uh, the, uh, point. But, <coughs>、um, He will not care about your face. He will. You can actually challenge him if you dare. If you are really well prepared, is that actually very facts based, very evidence based? You can actually challenge on the facts, but be really thoroughly be prepared because uh, uh, he will actually challenge you equally harsh. Okay, and if you are not well prepared enough,、uh, you are going. He's going to give you a very hard time.、Okay. So this, this is based on the, the, the people that has worked with him、uh, closely in the past, right? Uh, I think we missed out the point on、uh, setting high,、um, high standards, extremely high standards for himself and for his team. Now, how high are the standards? Number one, he does not,、um, he does not care who does the job or who does not do the job. Right?、Uh, he actually, as long as he wants to get it, gets it done, he will get it done. How, how do I mean by that?、Um, A lot of times he will go jogging, 
right? Uh, the equation is very avid, jog and uh, cycle. He likes to cycle, he likes to jog. And because he's a prime minister, he has to jog with his bodyguards, right? And he is also the architect of um, you know, the garden city concept. The, the city is also a garden. So when he goes jogging, he will always look at all the trees and the flowers and is, is everything okay in good condition. So whenever he finds that if there's a tree who was struck by lightning and uh, part of the tree has died and, uh, and, and uh, partially it's green leaves and the other part is uh, it's brown leaves and, and so on, what he'll do is he'll ask his bodyguard to call whoever is in charge to fix the problem. Right? And, uh, he doesn't care that this is not the bodyguard's job. That's not, that's not an issue. Um, he wants to get it done, he'll get it done. It's high standards. <coughs> Number two, it's, uh, it's also in, in Chongying Airport. We all know, if, you, if you've been to Singapore, you've been to uh, Chongying Airport. So um, Chongying Airport in the, um, I think it was in the, in the late 80s, uh, uh, there was the opening of Terminal 2, the Yang General, to the Bashan Dai, to the Moji, to, to, to Kaini. So he went to the Terminal 2 and everybody expected him to go around to see that uh, how smoothly the airport can operate. Before he arrives the airport, he finds that now how come there are no flowers, there are no planted flowers on the way to the airport. Right, uh, right so, so, so he doesn't care that you know, the road leading to the airport does not belong to the airport. I mean, it does not belong to the management of the airport. You just make a complaint to the airport. Go fix it. Right? It's not your job. Go find someone who is their job and go fix it. Right? He doesn't care who is the right person as long as you know, just whatever it is, just get it done. Right? This, is, this is a way of as well when high standards. To a certain extent that, um, you know, um, uh, when his wife passed away, if you read his memoirs, he's actually very close with his wife. Right? Uh, his wife passed away because when his wife was uh, died, he was not at his wife's deathbed. He had another lung infection, so he was hospitalized, and then his wife died, so he, he wasn't there. So it's really pretty sad for him. And uh, he went, uh, finally he discharged and was able to attend his wife's funeral. And at the end of the funeral, he went for a walk uh, along Singapore River, to So <coughs> uh, everybody was, was thinking that, okay, this is probably one of the places that you know, he uh, had a lot of walks with his wife and so on. Then he, he spotted something on the river and again asked the people around him to say that you know, there was a, a piece of rubbish. There's a piece of rubbish, rubbish on the river get someone to fix it. Now, he has high standards that, that goes beyond personal uh, emotional attachment. He just want that high standard. So he set high standards for um, what is corruption, as in it must be a clean government, anyone who's uh, caught doing anything that is bad, you're out. Right? Or you'll be, you'll be charged, you'll be sued, you'll be thrown behind bars. So there's, there's, there's this high standards for uh, <coughs> a very low level of uh, corruption. Uh, there is high standards of the kind of people that he, he picks for his own government. Right? He says, uh, well, you got to be good in your studies, you got to be good in, uh, you got to have good brains, you got to have uh, good uh, abilities in uh, uh, an area of a lot of things before you can be selected as potential ministers. So it's got high standards for everything that is what he what does as well. So, so that, that, is, uh, that is him. So in a way, that high standards and that you know, uh, straight to the point talking, in a way, working for him is almost like working for Steve Jobs. Right? If you work for Steve Jobs, um, um, whatever you send to Steve Jobs initially, as in he actually do something, you send him the prototype or some, something, his first reaction is, this is shit. That's Steve Jobs, right? Lee Kuan Yew will not tell you that this is shit uh, without giving you any, any reason. Lee Kuan Yew will give you a dressing down as why this, is, why this part is horrible, this is bad, and, and so on. Um, I had a friend who was uh, formerly his uh, translator. I mean, Lee Kuan Yew is pretty good in his Chinese. But even when it comes to China, he has a translator. Just in case that you know, he may miss certain words, certain ways of expression. So he's got a translator. Uh, to go with him uh, when, whenever he's dealing with the uh, Chinese government. 
So <coughs> this translator will, will, will need to not only just be the translator, but also need to do uh, summary of uh, the meetings and so on, and uh, make the Chinese uh, news releases. So every time there's a draft, the draft sent to Lee Kuan Yew, Lee Kuan Yew will, will actually change a lot of things. It will be very directed that why this and this and this is bad. Right, and he'll, he'll give his points to the extent that in the initial times, eventually Li Kuan Yew will be the person to write his own press release uh, in Chinese. Because uh, the, 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 tra uh, the translators somehow could not get it right. So he wrote it and, and just get the, make sure that the Chinese is, is, is in the right uh, uh, phrase in the right manner. Right. By the way, Li Kuan Yew learned Chinese only after he got into politics. Right. Lee Kuan Yew was, was uh, um, you know, his, his what, what, what we call as a uh, straight born Chinese of Peranakan, Fu Chunghua. Right, his, um, his, grand, his great grandfather, Zeng Zhu Fu, uh, went from uh, Guangdong province to Kejiang, from Guangdong province to, to Singapore, so his great grandfather. So for him, it's already the fourth generation. Um, <coughs> so basically, his family does not speak Chinese or write Chinese. Right, uh, his grandfather, um, thinking that, you know, because Singapore was a British colony, thinking that, you know, everything will be, uh, all kinds of uh, development will be very Western oriented, gave him the English name Harry. So uh, a, lot of, a lot of people thought that, initially thought that, oh, it's because he started in the UK, so he gave himself an English name. No, it was given by his grandfather. So it's a very ang anglicized family, uh, they speak English at home, uh, uh, they, they learn from young English and Malay. Not Chinese, right? He only learned Chinese after he got into politics um, in in the mid fifties. Because he got a Chinese student, so he actually learned in his adult life. And later on, his Chinese was so good that he's able to to uh, communicate and make speeches and uh, draft a lot of things in Chinese. So in a way, it's it's going back to yes, he's got very high intelligence, and at the same time, he is real, uh, really committed to a certain goal. And the moment he's committed, he's really drive through. Right, so that's that's part of the link when you <coughs> so um, oh yeah sorry uh, we have a high high, high standards of uh, wrong sequence so basically it, it's about pushing everybody to drive high standards there are no excuses he doesn't give any any, any uh, thought about excuses you got to do it uh, you got to reach the standards and for him he leads by example right, so that's <coughs> that's the uh, the part of the five politics now. The thing about um, the, uh, the those five qualities is if you do it a bit too much, sometimes you may have over self confidence, corporatism. Sometimes you can have an overreaction. Uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not a small problem, but you need to have a big reaction, go to that well. And uh, <coughs> overly dominant. And the last one, especially if you work in a corporate, it's something that uh, you, you need to really, really watch out for. Right, go into bit by bit. Overconfidence, as I mentioned earlier on, past success. Sometimes it's like, because I have been right in the past, therefore I will be right. right. So overconfidence, I was always right for the last 30 years, 20 years, and in the future I will always be right. So that, that conviction, in a way, I would say most of the time he is actually right. Uh, but then there are also times that he is wrong. So again, um, you, uh, is, is it an overconfidence because you had so much success in the past? Also, because I have been right, if you have a different opinion, then you're wrong. Uh, this, this, is, this is a way, um, and then people have got different ways of how to ma manage the, uh, the country's finances, how to manage um, different types of people. Um, if you have a different opinion, you're wrong. Now, you know, for this case, in, in, in time, we talk about the uh, minister's salary. On the, when in the early days when Singapore was just founded, Lee Kuan Yew was so poor, so broke that the main breadwinner at, ha at his home is his wife. So, Right, uh, there's a law firm called Lee and Lee, which is run by his wife, not him. He's, he's running Singapore, the wife runs law firm. So the law firm feeds the family. 
when uh, provides education for, for, for his children. So, <coughs> so in, in early days of, of uh, government, um, the, the, the whole cabinet was, was paid very, very low. Uh, you need to come from a family that, uh, that has your own family money. Otherwise, you will not be able to be a minister for Singapore. Okay, so, so that, uh, that is, um, um, that's the kind of situation. So, <coughs> Have, have, uh, having, having that, um, you know, the, the idea is, you know, if you want someone to be a minister for Singapore, you've got to pay them decent wages. You've got to pay them enough. Right? Otherwise, who wants to you know, uh, volunteer the time, the energy, the life to, to the country and not get paid? You know, it's, it's a, it, it doesn't work. And of course, it doesn't work. So you need to pay uh, ministers and, and civil servants enough. So there are, there are a few objectives. One of them, of course, it's... Uh, no, we want to stamp out corruption, so we've got higher pay for civil servants, so there's less of a temptation uh, for corruption. The other thing is you want to have the right talents to, um, to work for you and not just hire someone who's willing to uh, work for the kind of pay. So you've got to pay, pay a, 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 a better pay. So in a way, Yes, it is definitely true that you need to pay people uh, the right kind of pay. But how do you benchmark what is the right kind of pay? So um, in, 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 um, in the late, later parts of the whole pay strategy is they benchmark, the whole Singapore government benchmark their own pay according to um, what the corporate CEO or senior VP of not just a country, but of Asia Pacific at least. You know, if a CEO for Asia Pacific or a global CEO is going to be paid, we benchmark against them. Right? And then uh, if in a certain industry, you've got huge wage, uh, huge, huge pay inflation. Like in China over the last few years, we've got huge wage inflation. People are, paying, uh, are being paid a lot and a lot and a lot, but productivity doesn't go up. So, the <laughs> right, so so that's happened a lot in China. It happened a lot in the rest of the world, especially for 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 the upper levels of people. So, <clears throat> so you may have wage inflation for that. You find that you know your your pet, the whole campuses are packed to very high pay. Okay, that's one part. And two is the latest research is that yes, pay is important, but to a certain extent. Right. Um, if you want, if, if the strategy is to entice people from a high paying private sector to come to work for the public sector, there will be people who, no matter how much you pay them, they will not come and work for the public sector. And of course, there will be people who, who, are, who, who really want to serve the country and will come to you, they come to the public sector, even though the pay is low. Right? So, so, so pay is important, yes. Pay is important to take care of a family, to make sure that the family is well taken care of. Yes, those are important, but to a certain extent, and beyond that, there is less and less of an importance. So that part, somehow it's like, you know, um, um, it doesn't quite sink in with Lee Kuan Yew and as a result, it doesn't quite sink in with uh, the rest of government as well. I still believe it's high pay. And it's embarrassing high in the sense that, you know, uh, for a small country, uh, the minister is the highest paid in the world. But even though it's got a huge GDP, it's got great achievements, but it's really actually high. So that's, that's a kind of imbalance. Uh, and that kind of high pay, in a way, is that, you know, the good thing about high pay, just uh, a bit of this, it's not about whether they are paid high or low. It's about in a good time when everybody has got jobs, everybody's pay are also increasing, everybody's quality of life is improving, then it's okay. I don't care how much you are paid as long as my quality of life is improving. But due to external factors, you know, the whole economy getting more stagnating, everything gets slowed down, and some policies are not really driven uh, well enough. So the quality of life in Singapore for the past 10 years uh, to, to a certain uh, proportion is actually going down. People are finding it hard to get higher pay. It's hard, if you lose a job around 40 years old, 
it's hard to get the job you want as a first job. Right? So this it's, it's, it's a kind of thing. So there are, there are struggles, there are, there are tensions. When the quality of life is going down, then people are going to turn around and say, why is it that I cannot get a higher pay and you get such high pay? Right? It's a kind of sentiment that has a backlash on on uh, on, uh, on its own government. So it's it's, <coughs> uh, it's it's a part that somehow does not sink in with uh, within and, and the rest of government. Right. So so it's an overreaction. Sometimes you take extreme action just to make sure that you have immediate effectiveness. Yeah, it's really good. But um, sometimes for that for immediate effectiveness. Uh, it may make people uh, question the policy. So the, the, the most famous one is chewing gum. The Singapore Right? Because it is deemed as the, the nuisance that will jam up the subway trains. So, so, so that's um, they, they put a gun on the subway doors and doors will not close properly and uh, jam up the whole subway system. So the solution, very simple, ban all three. <laughs> Overreaction, yes. Yes, you have immediate effectiveness, right? No, no more jamming of doors for sure, but it really is an overreaction, right? Some people will say that this is not his own policy because by then he was no longer the, the prime minister. Uh, this was done in the early 90s, but uh, he had, I'll, I'll say he probably has a huge, um, uh, what we call influence over that. Okay, so this other something you you have an overreaction to 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 a small problem, right? <coughs> and of course, the last one will be um, over dominant. <coughs> um, so if if you like I said, you can challenge it, you can have a different opinion, but you better be thoroughly well prepared because if you're not, uh, he will challenge you back, and you'll be. Severely bruised, you'll be severely hurt. You uh, you'll definitely he will tell you you need to do a job uh, probably, and uh, you probably don't want to raise any other suggestion in the next time. So uh, if you do that more and more, and um, the, the comment from some some people was that you no know, Singapore the thing about Singapore is its top level ministers are great, but its middle civil servants are weak. But the question goes back one step is, if the middle civil servants are weak, whose fault is that? From高層的那些部長都很難。但是中層的那些公務員就不行。但如果中層的公務員不行,問題是誰?是誰造成問題?高層嘛,they hire the civil servants, right? So uh, they, they create in that, that uh, culture. So you have a team of do as told, uh, do as people who do. And they do because the upper levels tell them this is the way to do it. They just follow without thinking, just follow to the note. And uh, you have too few thinkers. Right? And as, as a result, not just the middle uh, level civil servants, uh, it could be the majority of the population. A lot of people are just say, whatever you want me to do, I'll just do it. I'll, I'm, I'm less prone to think, whether to criticize, give suggestions, to think something else. You have less thinkers. Now, and uh, you know, if, if this were to be run in company, it will cause disengagement if ideas were shot down too prematurely. There could be some ideas, it's not a complete idea, it's not a foolproof idea, but there may be some good points in the idea. And if you shoot it down too, too soon, you kill the whole idea, and you also kill that creative, uh, that enthusiasm for creativity. In a company, it's going to be worse because well, if you run a country, at the very least, there are still, I mean, in the case of Lee Kuan Yew, he still has got some people within his cabinet who are still able to challenge him. He's still got some people in the cabinet that he really, really respects the views. Right? Especially he knows himself that he's not an economics or finance expert. All, almost all, I think all, his uh, previous finance ministers basically uh, are experts in, in their own field and he actually consult them for opinions. He doesn't tell them what to do at all. 
Okay, so 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 very basically, it knows when to be really dominant and when to defer to others, right? He also knows some of them, some of his heads of civil service, 他的一些就是公务员的那个领导，就是首席公务员。Uh, <coughs> he knows some of those people really has got um, uh, uh, a critical mind and is able to think something else. He actually bring them out for lunch and tell them that today the lunch is not between prime minister and you know, permanent secretary or, or, or whatever the job title. Today the lunch is not between prime minister and permanent secretary or whatever the job title. A frank discussion about whatever you think you feel just then, right? So, so, uh, so, so he, he he wants to tap into the brains of certain things. He may not agree with the critical thinking from some of the staff, but he would like to have a different point of view. He like to challenge that thinking. He also likes to be challenged on certain kind of thinking. The only thing is, he only do that to some selected few people. So that, that that's what it does. Now, if you put it to a company, number one is you may not have the luxury of having that kind of high quality stuff in your company. Right? You are lucky if you have very a very capable CEO or very capable GM. Um, the the rest of them may not have the kind of um, um, uh, mental dexterity that you challenge them and then they got something to challenge back. May or may not be uh, be that. Number two is that uh, <coughs> not everybody can withstand. The, the, the sense of dominance. So if you're overly dominant, people may just say, "I'm not going to make any suggestion because I am likely to be shot down by you." So uh, in this company, I will just do as told. And <clears throat> in today's companies, in today's business, even for China, China used to be the factory of the world. China is a factory of the world. Right? It's, it's low end. Labor-intensive, uh, <coughs> whatever it is, whatever the boss wants, just do it. So that's 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 in the old China. Now China is trying to make the transition to something that is more on mental, something that needs uh, creativity, innovation, something that taps on brain power than on labor power. Now, the 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 Chinese version is more is more 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 Right, you may need uh, labor power as well, but this is more emphasis on brain power. So if you were to shoot down ideas too much, your employees are going to come to the company and say that I'm going to leave my brain at home. You just shut my butt, put that down. Yeah, I'll come, I'll come. Okay, so so I'm not going to come up with any ideas. I'm just going to just whatever you want me to do, I'll just do it. Right, I'm not going to risk my own face, my own embarrassment uh, in front of all my colleagues. To tr just try to make a suggestion, right? Uh, so, so this that 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 um, uh, this is something, especially uh, as managers in China, probably will want to uh, uh, be very careful about. You don't want to be so overly dominant that your employees stop giving any contributions or stop being creative. That, <coughs> that's something to, to as a precaution. So the thing is that <coughs> even even as A great leader like Nick Bonnie, who's got who really has got a huge uh, level of achievements when he's on his own with his team um, over a number of years. Uh, even a great leader like this has got issues. Has got difficulty trying to balance the, the good and the negative aspect of his own leadership qualities. The same qualities that drive uh, that give him success when he overdo it, when he overdid it. Can actually drive into some drawbacks. I wouldn't say failures, but there are drawbacks. So, 缺点不叫失败，叫缺点的遗憾，欠缺。So, for the rest of us who are maybe not as um, uh, strong mentally as as Li Kuan Yew is, how can we then try to achieve the right balance as a leader? We have obviously for the rest of us, we have our own leadership qualities, and obviously we also make mistakes. So how do we have the kind of balance? So in this case, can we have kind of five-minute discussion in your own group? Just have a brainstorm. You have all the pros and uh, all the policies, and you may have some drawbacks, some mistakes. How do you make sure that you reduce the number of mistakes that you make as a leader? Right? Five minutes in some part.